Good morning. It's good to be here with you this morning. I'm Pastor Steve, one of the pastors here at Valley Life Church. And uh, I hope, despite the dreariness of the weather, that there's some sunshine in your life today. Hopefully it's an opportunity to be with people that you love and care about and uh, are expressing your love for them and your care for them. I'd like you to join me in prayer, and then we'll get into the Word together. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we open our hearts to you this morning. We pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would open the understanding of our hearts that we might comprehend the Scriptures and understand them, Lord, that we might know your will and follow you. We thank you for this day where we remember to remember those who have had an impact on our life and have loved us well. And so, God, we say to you, thank you. Thank you for loving us and not just loving us, but loving us to the full extent of what that word means. We pray as we get into the word this morning that it would grab our hearts, it would grab our minds, and that, God, we would walk in it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Do you know what it's like to feel unloved or unlovable? It's kind of a dumb question, isn't it? Because we've all felt that. To some degree, we can all relate to Charlie Brown. They say that Charles Schultz created Charlie Brown as kind of a picture of himself, frightfully shy child, growing up uh, in Minnesota and uh, created Charlie Brown as the ultimate um, good grief, especially around Valentine's Day when he would sit underneath the mailbox waiting for uh, Valentine to come and it never did. If you find yourself this morning struggling to be loved or to feel lovable, then this sermon is for you. And if you find yourself struggling to love those nearest to you, and your, your love has certainly dissipated over the years, then this message I have today is for you. Jesus said that the love of many would grow cold in the last days. So my question is, have the trials related to COVID made you cranky and short with others. I hope this message will put you out of that pit or bring you, draw you out of that pit and send you on a, set you up on a rock, kind of like it says in Psalm 40. It says, he drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Or do you love well and receive love? then I hope this message will simply spur you on to more love and deeper love in your life. And so I want to begin by, by leading us all to holy ground, because it's there that we will find the Lord whom the Bible says, God is love. And Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher from England, once said that nearness to God is happiness. So no matter where you've been, no matter what you have done, no matter how adamantly opposed to Christianity was your disposition, no matter how much evil you have vomited on this planet, sorry for the language there, God stands ready to forgive and redeem you through Jesus Christ the Lord. There's something special that holy ground does to us. For sure, it captures our attention and it heightens our awareness of what is important. And if you were married, it was the altar where you exchanged your vows. If you're a public servant, it's the ceremony where you pledged your commitment to the public whom you would serve. If you're a doctor, it is the Hippocratic Oath to seek the healing of your patients. If you're a parent, those of you that are parents, it was the delivery room where you exclaimed, it's a miracle. And then after your fourth child, it's a miracle. And you knew then and there that you would love this miracle all of your life. It was holy ground. Maybe you're aware of several examples from Holy Scripture. Jacob's ladder is one. 
Jacob is fleeing from his brother Esau and in a dream as he's on the road and has his head on a rocky pillow, he has a dream where he sees angels ascending and descending upon him and God above him promising him the blessings of Abraham. And when he wakes up, he said, this is none other than the house of God. And then he made an offering there because it was holy ground. Or Moses at the bush on fire, but it was not consumed, where God reveals his name to the reluctant prophet after he is told to remove his sandals. Or the holy of holies in the tabernacle where the high priest brought blood to atone for the sins of the people, and God would meet him there at what was called the mercy seat. Or the stall in Bethlehem where the Savior was born. Or the shore of Galilee where a great light shone and Peter cried out, Get away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Or on a little island called Patmos where John fell in mesmerizing amazement before his vision of the risen Lord. I remember places that I was at in Israel years and years ago when I got to visit Israel and um, I got to go to the place where Jesus was tried before Pontius Pilate. It's called the pavement. And archaeologists have actually authenticated that this could be the actual place where Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate. And I can remember feeling that sense of walking where Jesus walked and that sense of holy ground where the man who created the universe was standing trial before his own demise. We call this book, or these 66 books, we call them the Holy Bible. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid and I saw that, I had no clue what that meant. I just meant it was something, I just thought it's got to be special. It's the Holy Bible. It's the books that are set apart by God. And I can remember being frustrated, especially as a teenager, trying to read the Bible. I would get to Genesis 4, maybe, and then in the drawer it went again. I just couldn't understand it. Then I was sitting at a concert at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, California, and the light went on. And he opened my understanding that I might understand the scriptures, and then all of a sudden the things that I was reading in the Bible came alive. And so if you are with us this morning, either online or here, um, a great prayer to be praying is, Lord, open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from your word. Because so often we think we know it like the disciples of Jesus thought that they had it wired and they thought that they were going to do great things for him. But when he rose from the dead and met up with him, he said to them, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. They didn't get it. These are the things which I told you while I was still with you that all things are going to come to pass that are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then it says, he opened their understanding that they might understand, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And then all of a sudden, the book my grandma had given me as a kid felt like holy ground. It was powerful. And as you read and think and walk upon its pages, it does something to you that only can be described as phenomenal, miraculous, or really cool. Really cool. Remember, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Each of the Gospels concludes with, well, the Gospel it's the writing of the eyewitnesses who give us the details of Jesus' bloody death and triumphant resurrection. And as you approach these blood-stained pages in holy writ, there's a palpable sense that the ground on which you stand is different than any other place on earth. When you have Scripture, you have holy ground wherever you go. In Jesus' sufferings, you are partaking of the holiest of all, and it may be advisable, to remove your shoes. And when you peer in, you're immediately struck by the love of Christ, who one writer declared, who loved me and gave himself for me. And that word love, the same word in John 3, 16, the same form of that word, agape, that he gave us the full extent of his love by going to the cross on our behalf. 
<clears throat> my heart really goes out to school-age kids. Us adults, I don't think we realize how difficult the COVID season has been for our kids. Um, and, and, and one thing in particular has been very, very, very difficult. Kids are used to going to school, meeting up with their friends for sure. That's important. But actually, they have lost that sense of connection being on sports teams and being able to compete with other schools and be able to, to work hard to achieve their goals with their teammates and to enjoy that with them. And I have seen that on their faces when we've talked about that. And especially if you're a senior, it's very, very, very difficult. Now, there's probably some kids that are like, yeah, I don't have to compete. Like, it's kind of like a safety thing. Like, if I would have competed this year, I would have gone to state, you know, or something like that. But the reality is, whether we win or lose in competition, that competition for a kid is really important to them. And not only in sports, but in um, things like musical recitals and and um, arts and crafts and other things that kids do where they're expressing themselves and they can't really get into that now, we as adults need to realize that they're really struggling with that. I, I can get all the competition I need by watching my hockey team play on TV. I feel totally fulfilled. <laughs> but not the kids these days. They're feeling kind of torn down, worn down by it. So I grieve the loss with them, and I hope, though, at the same time that some of them are going to find that Christ's love for them, even though they're learning it at this young age, is all that they really need. It's all that they really need. And so I'm going to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to John 13, and we're going to move through this passage of Scripture together, and I hope that it has a great impact on us this morning. John chapter 13, if you don't have a Bible, there's one there in the pew. And we're going to begin with verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. What hour was this? The hour of his suffering. In another part of Scripture, it says, this is your hour and the power of darkness this is the time where Christ will go to the cross and win the victory over sin and death and Satan. But it will be a hard struggle and a fight for him, and he knew what was up ahead. He knew that this was the hour that he would die. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put, or actually the word there can be cast or thrown into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing now you do not understand. What I, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When the Lord had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. 
I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever (coughs) receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Verse 1 of this chapter is a jewel of a verse. This is a verse that has gotten me through a lot of dark nights in my life. This is a verse that has guided my way for many, many years. Because I, like all of you, need to be loved and to feel like I am lovable And the reality is there's times where I don't feel loved and I don't feel lovable, but the reality is that Jesus loves us to the very end, all the way. His his love lasts. He's a bridegroom who keeps his word. When he said, for better, for worse, he meant it until death do us part, and then for him, not even until death do us part, for all eternity. And I want to remind you that one of the disciples whose feet were washed that day was Judas Iscariot. He loved his own who were in the world, Judas not actually being one of his own, but he loved those also who did not love him. Hmm. And he loved them to the very end. We all need a firm foundation these days. We need a rock We all need a refuge from the storm. We need a strong tower. We need the promise that God is with us. We need to know that Jesus will love us to the very end. As a matter of fact, the last verse in Matthew says, Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He had told his disciples three times that he was going to, Uh, to die and then rise the third day, three times before he went up to Jerusalem to have that happen. Meaning, I'm going to die, but listen up, guys. I'm going to rise the third day. I will be with you always, I promise. The disciples, though, the Bible says, were foolish and slow of heart. They didn't hear what he was saying. They, like all men, want to tell God how things should be. Do you remember how Jesus responded to Peter when the fishermen rebuked the idea that he might be taken and be killed? No, Lord, I'll never let this happen to you. Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You do not discern the things of God, but the things of men. And so that's why the pastors here at Valley Life are always harping on the importance of listening to God's word because when you get into God's word, you're reminded he loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the very end. I don't know about you guys, but um, I woke up one day and I was in my 60s. It seems like yesterday I was in my 20s. But yet, over all these years, Christ has loved me well. And all I'm saying is, you're going to get older and you're going to put on the years and the 20s and 30s, I don't know what happens to those, but you're in those and then all of a sudden you're out of them. I don't know what happens. I think it's because you're raising kids and you have your eyes on other things and then you wake up and go, oh, I'm in midlife crisis. I should be having a crisis right now. (laughs) But to know that Christ is with you always is a rock for your soul and an anchor for your boat. I love Jesus so much for loving me. I I feel today like I did when I was 17 years old, just a boy, and I responded to the love of Christ by saying silently and then out loud, why would he give his life for me? And if you've heard me preach before, you've said like, man, this guy sounds like a broken record. 
Now, let's face it, you guys, most of you don't even know what a record is. <laughs> but I sound like a broken one because it's true to this day. Why would he give his life for me? I, I first met Jesus as a suffering Savior who took my sins on himself on the cross. It was so long ago. But I can remember every detail of that evening when I went forward and uh, gave my life to Christ that night. I remember at the place at the church I was at, it was interesting. You, you're in your seat, you say a prayer, and if you gave your life to Christ, you raise your hand. Then everybody stands up. Then you come forward, which was the real deal, because that was the scary part. And I can remember I was so, I don't know, excited. <laughs> I, I stood up and ran right into one of the beams there in the church. And I can remember this guy sitting there, a big smile on his face, just shaking his head and going, wow, that guy is messed up. Go forward, say another prayer there. Everybody claps for you. Go in the prayer room. Somebody prays for you there. Man, you have been prayed. You are saved. I went home and told a friend of mine, I said, uh, Steve, you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. We were sitting in, my, sitting in my Volkswagen van outside his house. I said, Jesus is the way, man. You need to give your life to him. This is a, just days after I got saved. <clears throat> he said, I said, do you want to give your life to Christ? He said, yes. I go, okay, let's say a prayer. We said a prayer. Dear God, forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. Make me a Christian, something like that. I said, okay, Steve, now... To really be saved, you have to go to church with me next week and say a prayer and go forward and go in the prayer room and all those things. I had no clue, obviously, how it worked. I went home and called an old elder friend of mine, and he said, McGuire, he's already saved. I called Steve back up. I said, Steve, you're already saved. You're good to go. <laughs> LAUGHTER I, I love Jesus for that. So now that when Jesus asked me to do things that are out of my comfort zone, I'm willing. Because he has always kept his part of the bargain. Always. Always. Faithful. Always. So do you need some stability in your life? Do you long to be loved with a committed, everlasting love? Jesus will not let you down. He will be there for you. You can count on him coming through even when circumstances look bleak. Because he loved them, he loved his own to the very end. And Jesus' love, I, I got to tell you, I ran into this verse years ago, and when I ran into it, I flopped on the floor because I couldn't believe it was in the Bible. And so if a few of you flop on the floor as I read these passages from Scripture, just know that you're not alone. Turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. Luke 12, verse 35. <clears throat> Jesus is talking about the second coming. And he says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. So Luke 12, I don't want you to miss this passage. Luke 12, 35 through 40. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Verse 37, the verse that I, I can't believe is in the Bible. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he, that is the master, the Lord Jesus, will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. But go back to verse 37. Truly I say to you, he, the Lord Jesus, will dress himself, this is in the kingdom of God, for service and have them recline. You and I get to recline. We've got the easy chair at the table where there is a banqueting feast that is bar none, the best feast of all time. 
And he will come (laughs) and he will serve them. When we read John 13, some of you were like, ah, there's Peter again, you know. Always sticking his foot in his mouth. But when I read this verse, I I thought to myself, Lord, do you understand that when he serves you, he is going to have nail prints in his hands and you're going to see those as he sets a great feast before you and he serves you? Hmm. Wow. I don't know about you, but I don't feel worthy. And if I can accept that as the truth, and today you could leave here saying he loves me and he'll love me to the end, and in the kingdom of God, he is going to come with his nail-pierced hands and feet, and you will see him and he will serve you. The Lord of the universe will serve you. Then that's a verse to hang on to, to say I am deeply loved by God. Why on earth, Jesus, would you do that? (laughs) Why... Why in heaven would you do that? He will serve you. Back to John 13. Now down here on earth, just before his passion, he takes the position of a servant and washes the feet of the 12. Why does he do that? Well, one, to show us what's expected of a Jesus follower. And two, I think, to inspire us to do as he did. First to humble us and then to challenge us to love others in a humble and sacrificial way. How else could you interpret this scripture? He demonstrates love by receiving sinners and offering eternal life to them. Through him the kingdom of God comes to earth and needy people are healed and some are made, the Bible says, completely well, meaning their sins are forgiven and they experience a new life in Jesus. Wow. Sometimes I wonder what happened to the woman with the issue of blood or the paralytic who was lowered through the roof, the roof to Jesus or blind Bartimaeus or the boy raised to life in the city of Nain. Did these fortunate ones go on to follow Jesus? We don't know for sure, but we do know that his love endures. He began a work in you and will continue it until he comes again He loved them to the end. And now I want you to look at verse 10 very carefully because this is also a very important verse in this narrative. It says that you yourselves are also clean, meaning thoroughly washed. Jesus said to them, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. When you commit your life to Christ, you are completely clean. You've been washed. You've been made pure. You can now stand before God with a clean heart and a clean mind because you have been washed by the work of Jesus Christ in your life. And Jesus is saying that these disciples who really didn't have it all together had been washed. Eleven of the twelve had been washed But he said, you do have to wash your feet because they're going to get dirty. And what he's saying is, we are completely clean, but as we walk through life, we look down and go, oh my goodness, there's dirt on my feet. And I need that to be forgiven and I need that to be washed. And so whoever sins, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, even the stuff we pick up on our feet. But don't get Jesus wrong. You are completely clean in Christ, completely washed in Christ. And so when, when we're baptized, the Bible says we're buried with him in baptism and we're raised to newness of life. And that washing, that baptism is the cleansing factor in our life. And I know some of you are probably saying, my goodness gracious, I was washed when I was a young child, but it seems like I've needed a bath ever since. But no, that's not true. You have been made clean, but your feet are dirty. They need to be washed. I think it's a great perspective because it shows me how God sees me. He sees me as washed, as clean. 
But he looks and he goes, McGuire, you're holding a grudge against that person. You have to have your feet washed because they're getting dirty with that resentment that you have in your heart and you need them washed. Jesus' love is coupled with his lordship. And so here's a very important question for this message today. Do you have trouble letting Jesus love you? Is your righteousness based on the fact that you have done things for him? Or is your righteousness based on the fact that he has done things for you? Even if you were to meet in the middle, my question still stands. Do you have trouble letting Jesus love you? Jesus says, I am the Lord and the teacher. And there is a significance in the original language that puts it like this. I am the Lord. I am the teacher. There are no others above me. I am it. <clears throat> you ought to do as I say. And it seems to me that in the end, what he wants is what's best for everyone. Jesus is Lord is not a slogan, it's the truth, and the sooner we submit to it, the better off we are. We can only guess why Peter said, not me, Lord. You want to know what the, Peter's attitude was? Here's how the original says it. Will you wash my feet? Oh, you're not going to understand now, but you'll understand later. You will not, no way, no how, ever, forever, forever and ever wash my feet. No way. You go, I, I, I didn't read that when we read that. That's what it says in the Greek. In other words, he's making it clear to Jesus that this is not going to happen. Whew. What was his motive? We, we don't know what his motive was. We tend to pick on Peter, don't we? Was it pride? Was it an attitude like, but Lord, I, I know the rest of these guys need to have their feet washed, but not me. I, I can clean my own feet, thank you. Kind of like he would say not long after this when Jesus said he was going to Jerusalem and he was going to be killed and then rise from the dead. Peter said, no way, Lord, this will never happen. I will fight to the end. And then, of course, what does Jesus say to him? Before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Was it embarrassment? Lord, you don't understand. This is the job of a house servant to wash feet. You're the Lord. You're the teacher. You're kurios. You're, you're the one. I can't let you wash my feet. Hey, fellas, what are you doing? He's the Lord. We should be washing his feet. I, I kind of remember, remember John the Baptist attitude? He should be baptizing me, not me, him. Like maybe Peter was thinking, I should be washing his feet, not me, not, not him washing my feet. Did Peter have a moral problem? Like he did at the beginning when he met Jesus after Jesus had caused the fish to multiply and they could barely bring the fish into shore. And when Peter comes up to Jesus, he says, get away from me, kurios, Lord. I am a sinful man. You don't know how sinful I am. I don't know. Or was Peter being humble? Was he saying, Lord, I just can't do this because I know who you are. I can't do this. I, remember, Lord, I'm the one who said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I, remember me, Jesus? I'm the one who said that. I can't have you wash my feet. I know who you are. Maybe he was being humble. But Peter must do as Jesus said or or else. Jesus is loving and firm. He does not tolerate disobedience. He doesn't say to Peter, well, I guess you're different than the rest. I'll let you off the hook, Peter. No, Peter is summarily rebuked. No part. You're out. No part. If I don't wash your feet, you have no part with this group. Hit the road. I wonder if Peter heard those words in his sleep after that encounter and how he found out that the lordship of Christ challenges us. 
Do you struggle with letting others love you, let, let alone Jesus? Do you struggle with that? You know, when I struggle with myself and feeling like I don't deserve to be loved, I, I tend to not allow other people to love me or affirm me. We either struggle with pride or pain, and we can end up shutting others out of our lives. So Jesus says, this is really important. I must love you. I must wash your feet. Why? Because I want you to follow my example and wash others' feet. And you'll always need your feet washed because they're going to get dirty. So I come to Jesus and I say, I need your love. Lord, will you wash my feet? And he replies, of course. But Jesus' love is not cheap. It's not cheap grace. It's demanding. Because several times he says, now you do this as I have done this to you. You follow my example. No bigwigs in the kingdom of God. No bigwigs. You're a great, you're a great teacher. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do an inference here. Forgive me. Uh, I'm not going to get into particular. You're a great teacher who goes around the world talking about God, getting people to believe that you're some moral principle that everybody should follow, and then you die, and then everybody finds out that you are a fraud. Jesus demands that we get right with him and that we are real with him. There are no big shots in the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus said those who are like children and those who are the humble and the servants of all, those are the greatest in the kingdom of God. So if you're, if you're pleased with just serving and serving God in your environment and you're just happy, happy as can be and you don't need to push yourself forward, you're in a good place. <clears throat> Jesus' love is demanding because he said, as I have done it to you. The Bible also says, husbands, love your wives as, just as Christ loved the church. <sighs> Big demand. <laughs> we are to love one another in the church as Jesus loves us. This is my command that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. <clears throat> God forgive us for being so splintered in the body of Christ. God forgive us for thinking we're better than other Christians or that other Christians would have it much better if they were like us. God help us to be humble and to stay humble. Jesus commanded difficult things. He says in Mark's gospel chapter 8, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. It's the tough words that make the Christian life a life and not an experience. It's a life. And it's a life of many ups and downs and ups and downs. And I'm walking along and I look down and I go, oh my gosh, my feet are dirty again. Mindy, could you wash my feet? <laughs> I, 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 I walk through life and I'm wanting to follow Jesus, but I look down and there's grime all over my feet. So I go to God and I get that grime fixed, but it's a life. I remember when I first became a Christian, I was so excited, I called everybody I knew and said, you need to give your life to Christ. One of them was a cousin of mine and I was so excited because I thought she was a Christian. And I said, I just gave my life to Christ a few days ago and it was awesome. And she said, I went through that phase when I was your age. I'm still going through that phase. It's been 45 years. It's a life. It's not an experience. There's a lot of experiences along the way, but it's a whole life. And if this is the day where your life turns around and you commit your life to Christ, then your life begins today and then ends down the road. But it's a whole life of following Christ, and the apostles knew that very well as they gave their lives in the end for believing that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. How do we apply this to our lives? John said 
in one of his little letters, he said, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let's take these words that we have learned today and put them into practice. Now, I got to tell you a story. I went to a church once, Grace Brethren Church, very interesting group of people, great group of people, and uh, they actually took this command of Jesus literally. Have any of you had that experience, like feet washing in a church? Yeah, okay. And it was really a cool experience. The gals went into one part of the facility and the guys went into another and there were a bunch of pails and you'd get down on your knees and you would, uh, they'd pull the socks off of these grubby, grimy, dirty old feet and you would like put, I don't, I don't think we put any soap on them. <laughs> Probably should have put soap on them and some cleansing stuff too. But you just put water over them and you just kind of like rubbed them a little awkwardly and then pulled them out and you dried them like Jesus did. I can't say that was the only time I ever did that. I'm not against that whatsoever because it was a humbling experience, but I think Jesus is saying that we are to be humble in our approach to other people. We are to serve them humbly. Now, if your community group is really close and you want to do an actual feet washing, I think that would be awesome. Let me just recommend the dudes do the dudes and the gals do the gals. It's just not right to have it the other way these days. I love my community group. My community group is uh, so life-giving to me. I just love them. And... uh, they, they will sometimes, uh, we will contact each other um, during the week. And, and uh, uh, just this last week, one of the guys in the group contacted everybody in the group via text and said, I was reading in my devotions this morning about who, in their devotions, it said, who is it that encourages you? And he wrote us a text and he said, I just want you all to know that you guys encourage me and I appreciate that very much. It was great. And our group is, you know, we're older, and so, and and one or two of us have some underlying issues. So we've been really careful, like if there's been any sickness or we've been within a bow shot of anybody with COVID, we've just said, okay, we're not going to meet this week, we'll meet next week. And so we've been really sensitive to each other that way, and so far we've been absolutely healthy, which I think is awesome. We also can be sacrificing, and you parents know this, your time and your money to educate and discipline your kids. Kids are a lifetime project. And for those of you that have kids in the late teens that think they're gone, they're never gone. Which, for some of us, we'd say it's not a bad thing. But it's good for them to be out on their own, but even when they're out on their own having your grandkids, you're like... Man, I'm concerned about my grandkids now. I used to be concerned about my kids, but now I'm concerned about my grandkids. But you would do anything for them, and you would be there for them any time of the day or night if they needed you. Uh, Yesterday, my son Sean came over to uh, practice his sermon because in about an hour here, he's going to be preaching over at the First Baptist Church. And... uh, I didn't tell anybody that earlier because I, well, I wanted people to come to our church today, you know. Um, (laughs) But I, as I sat and listened to him walk through his message, I was so humbled that he was in the business of saying to the people at First Baptist, I love the Bible and I want to tell you about the Jesus and the gospel of the Bible. I was just very, very proud of him. Husbands and wives... I can tell you I washed my wife's feet once. I guess the foot washing thing for me is a one and done. Actually, before I proposed to her, it's kind of a sentimental story, I I went into the other room and I ran the bath water and she was like, whoa, what's going on here? And I made her take off her shoes and roll up her pants and I washed her feet. And believe me, that has not been forgotten. If you were to actually literally wash someone's feet, that would not be forgotten. It'd be remembered. 
Marriage is a difficult business because if you're not working on oneness in marriage, you will automatically be drifting away from one another. It is a, it is a work in marriage that you are working on being one with that other person and if you stop working, it's like we're working, we're working, we're working and then we put it in neutral on the hill as we fall backwards on the icy ground. In marriage, we are commanded to love our wives, husbands, as Christ loved the church and the wives to respect her husband and submit to him as the church reverences Christ. So I have an assignment for you. I'm a teacher, so I can do that. I'm I'm duly authorized to give assignments. My notes say three people, but how about two? I'll, I'll make it two people this week that you wash their feet, intentionally wash their feet. Now, and if you're, if you're listening to this and you're like, man, he wants me to actually get a basin of water and wash their feet, then more power to you. That's great. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying you're going out of your way to humble yourself before someone and to serve them in a way that you would not normally serve them. Just like the disciples were like, what's going on? The Lord and the teacher is going to wash our feet. Now, and again, let me add a little color, like color commentary to that story. Just because Peter is singled out doesn't mean the others were going like, you know what I mean? Like, ah, 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 what's going, you know, it doesn't mean that. Uh, Remember when James and John were arguing they wanted to be first in the kingdom? And then uh, the other disciples were like, oh, yeah, James and John, they're really, man, they're sons of thunder, you know, they always want stuff. But then we find out that all the disciples had the same attitude. They were all like, hey, I want a part of the kingdom. I want to be first. Hey, that'd be fun. Two people this week in your community group, in your family, where you work. How about just blowing somebody away at your work and serving them in a way where they would go like this? Like, why would you do that? Kind of like when Jesus washes your feet, why would you do that? And even risk a bit of embarrassment, like this could be embarrassing, but I'm going to do it anyway because Jesus said, just as I have done to you, you also do to one another. And last, spend some time on holy ground. And let the power of this wonderful collection of books bring you to Christ and cause that you would be humbled before him in order to serve him and be reminded that you are loved more than you would ever, ever, ever know. So much so that you would be embarrassed if you knew the extent of his love. If Jesus came through the door, he probably wouldn't have to come through the door. He could just appear. So Jesus appears and says, Rudy Pickens, come here, Rudy. And we have a basin of water, and he makes Rudy sit down, and then he gets down on his knees and begins to wash Rudy's feet as tears are flowing down Rudy's face, and possibly even in his heart he's going, not me. Not me. Doesn't he know I, I don't deserve this? And then I would say to Rudy, Rudy, none of us deserve that. None of us. Ah, uh, but he loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the very end. Come on up, Adrian, and let's pray. Let's stand with me, please, and let's pray together. Mm-hmm.